Um, somebody's asking, when do you think we'll know if um, getting, getting the disease actually gives you immunity? So what we think with most infectious diseases is once you get infected, you have some level of immunity for some period of time. That's usually on the matter of months, but we know with other coronaviruses that your immunity wanes over about a period of a year and you can be reinfected at least experimentally. So I think it'll probably take a year to know exactly if people can be reinfected at that time. I don't suspect if you just got infected th this month that you're going to be able to be reinfected in the next day or so. And I think the question is how durable is that immunity? So what about those cases in South Korea where they seem to have people who had it recently have been reinfected? So what that so it's important to remember the test not testing for the for the viable virus it's just testing for genetic material and it's now been shown that the, and this is what we all suspected was that those people when you get this virus it damages parts of your lungs and there's parts there's debris and people cough that up over a period of time and what ended up happening was that virus was actually debris mixed in with debris that was clearing from their lung. They couldn't actually culture the virus. It's just testing for the genetic material. So those people were not infected, were not reinfected. Yeah, good. That's, that's good news. Uh, so there is, there is such a thing as sort of immunity and it, it, it ultimately could happen even without a vaccine. But a lot of people would die in the process. Is that? Is that yes. Yeah. You need to get probably at least sixty percent or higher of the population uh, infected, and that's going to come at a huge cost. So if we can, we don't really want to do that if we can avoid it, especially because there are certain you can't really. It's you know we talk about cocooning the elderly, and I think we need to cocoon the elderly as best as we can. But you can't. It's not all ironclad, and I think you have to really be careful about how you do that because there's going to be interactions between high risk individuals and low risk individuals. And, and, and I wish there was a way to hermetically seal them off so that you don't do that, but it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And you're seeing that in Sweden, for example. So is it true to say that if we do open up um, and, and, and I expect we will, you know, different paces in different places that more people will die. I mean, that's just, that's just the reality. Yes, I, I, it is true. This isn't gone anywhere. And, this, this, and flattening the curve was never really about sa saving yeah. lives. It was preventing excess deaths. It was trying to spread out the same number of cases over a longer period of time. This has really been about hospital capacity. And right now, there's a kind of some people trying to move the goalposts here. And this not what, that's not what this was about. It was about hospital capacity. So for example, in Georgia, they are, they are talking about the fact that they're going to get more cases, they're going to get more deaths, and they're going to have beds. And I heard the Atlanta mayor say something like, you know, those are beds to die in uh, after the, to say that, you know, so it doesn't matter because we're trying to save lives. But, but there's no way to, to do that when you're dealing with an outbreak that's not going to go away. This is not a containable virus. So the American people have to realize that the number of cases is going to continue. As soon as you start peeling back social distancing, the cases are going to go up. We expect that. This is about preserving hospital capacity. And I think that needs to be the overriding philosophical principle that everybody has in mind because there are going, there's lots of people who, who misunderstand this. And I think it's because of the way this was presented by, the, by policymakers to the general public that they don't quite understand what flattening the curve actually meant. It's the same area under the curve. It's just happening over a longer period of time. And, and I mean, the only way in which that would change is if we actually got a treatment, right? That, that it was actually efficacious. Yeah, so the, the, we are, we did buy some time with, with this and we do have some good data coming out on Gilead's product where people improve much quicker. We didn't get a mortality benefit, but we get them out of the hospital faster if they get this treatment, which helps us with hospital capacity. So that is something that's good. Hopefully we will get some treatments that can change mortality. Maybe they'll do more studies on the Gilead drug tr in different patient populations showing a mortality benefit. Um, that would be great. There are other drugs. There's so many drugs that are in clinical trials right now that I can't keep track of them all. And, and we are moving really rapidly towards a vaccine, which was really what we need to have. That's the only way that we remove this threat. Um, but yes, if we could get something that, that decreased mortality, that would be really uh, a huge benefit. So, and what is your sense of, of, of success, of, you know, the progress there? And, and what do you think of this, of the malaria drug and, and zinc and, and the combinations and all of the studies that have come out about that, that sometimes seem contradictory? So, so hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are two drugs that, that have been around for a long time that are used for malaria and some autoimmune conditions. And these have generic antiviral effects and immune modulating effects and, and stuff in a test tube that works against coronavirus, but they had never been put up against the coronavirus. And they're not, even though they're approved and we give them to people, they're not, that doesn't mean that they're without side effects. Every drug has a side effect and every person has, there's a risk benefit calculation you have to take. And they hadn't been studied for coronavirus. And what we're, 
what we're seeing is people were, were you, I, and I actually prescribed it to two people um, before based on hospital-based protocols, but we needed a randomized controlled trial and we still need a randomized controlled trial to actually know whether it works or not. But what we're finding is that the more and more data comes out, it doesn't appear to necessarily have any real benefit here. And there is a cardio, there, there is toxicity these drugs do have, have side effects. And these side effects are different when you're giving them to a person who's not in the hospital, who's outside, who, who's got rheumatoid arthritis, which is a debilitating disease, and you give it. That's a different side effect tolerance than someone who's got a mild case of cor the coronavirus that may not need them, or someone who's hospitalized and really, really sick and already having heart rhythm problems, and then you're giving this drug to. So I, I think that all of that kind of got lost in the debate because you had people, you know, irresponsibly claiming that this is going to be this, this panacea, that everybody should be taking it. You had, you had patients that, so we, I know firsthand patients that were asked to be, to be in the clinical trial for it. They wouldn't go in the clinical trial because the president said they should just take it anyway. So the, these statements were actually hampering our ability to actually find out the true answer to this. And, and you can see now in the, in the middle of this whole thing, the FDA had to issue a, a, an advisory saying, this is a toxic drug. We, we don't recommend you give this without cardiac monitoring. So you, it, it really, you know, when politicians get into the science business, they can really foul things up. And I think the hydroxychloroquine example is, is a great one where science was really completely politicized and, and you, you were either on the hydroxychloroquine camp or you weren't on the hydroxychloroquine camp. And, and I think that, that really made it much, much worse uh, than it had to be. I don't suspect it's going to be one of our best drugs against this. I think that remdesivir, the Gilead drug looks good. And I think they're, you know, convalescent plasma giving blood from survivors, that may likely have a benefit. And there are other things that are gonna come down the line. But I don't think that hydroxychloroquine is going to be the answer uh, for this. But we, I want to get the trial results before I say definitively, and hopefully that randomized control trial will, will finish uh, soon. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time, so I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...